Uh, there was a movie back in 2012 that I'm sure some of you probably watched. Uh, it was a movie called Catch Me If You Can. Have you seen that? Raise your hand if you saw that. Yeah, it was quite a good film, that one. It's a true story about a guy called Frank Abagnale Jr. Uh, and I'm probably telling you something you already knew. But uh, this guy, before his 19th birthday, he successfully conned millions of dollars worth of checks. And it was, it was an amazing story, really. And, and not only was he a con artist in that way, not only was he a counterfeiter, but this guy also presented himself as a pilot, a doctor, and also like a lawyer. And it was just amazing how he did it. He was so confident in the way that he did it. It was quite a good looking guy. I mean, it was Leonardo DiCaprio that played, that played the character. He was a quite good looking guy and he had he just had such confidence in the way that he did things that people just believed it there was no real question about why he was doing what he was doing because he was confident in how he did it so therefore people just thought well if he if he looks like a pilot and if he sounds like a pilot and if he acts like that then he must be i'm not going to question that so he got away with so much just by the fact that nobody questioned who he was now, I brought that up this morning because I want to establish two fundamental truths before we move into the teaching today, uh, because I think these, I don't think these, I know these are essential to understanding what it is that I want to share with you today. And really, they're essential for our belief system overall and your faith overall. So what I want to establish today is that just like Frank Abagnale Jr., Ha Satan is a counterfeiter. Okay, Hasatan himself is a counterfeiter. You say, well, how is that true? Well, if you, if you think about how Hasatan works, there is no original thought in his head. Everything that he does, it takes a version of what God has done and he twists it. And he makes you believe that this new truth, his new truth, is now the truth. So he's just like Frank Abagnale Jr. He presents himself as a pilot, as a doctor, and all these different things. And sometimes we just believe it. We don't question it because it comes from this good looking guy. It comes from this confident place. So very rarely do we stop and say, wait, is this actually the truth? Is this actually the truth? Hasatan is a counterfeiter. Why is that important to us? It's important because as we've established that truth to say that we know that he counterfeits everything that Hashem does, we can also reverse that argument and we can say that Hashem is not a counterfeiter. Hashem is the original. Okay, so everything that Hashem does is the original version. You see, he doesn't need to counterfeit anything. Nothing. Because he's the original. So, what does this mean for us in our day-to-day -day lives? Let's establish that. What does this mean for us in our day-to-day -day lives? How do I know if something that I'm doing is proper or not? How do I know if this is actually proper or not to do? All you have to do to answer that question is ask yourself, is this a counterfeit of something else? Is this a counterfeit of something else? Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Christmas is a counterfeit of the truth. Easter is a counterfeit of the truth. Hasatan takes these things that we know to be true. We know Yeshua was born. We know he rose from the dead. He takes these things that we know to be true, but he puts his own twists on it and he injects paganism into these things. So if we find something that we know is a counterfeit, we can see it and we can prove that it's a counterfeit, we know that we shouldn't be involved in it. We should always want, and this is why in my own faith, in my own life, I'm done with counterfeits. I want to go back to the original source and I want to see what the actual original source was. I want to do exactly what my Messiah did. I want to, I want to celebrate the holidays that I know God himself created and he didn't have to counterfeit because he was the original. The absolute worst counterfeit that's ever happened, that's ever happened to mankind. And I'll, and I'll say this 
and bear with me on this, okay? Please, bear with me on this. I'll try to explain myself. The absolute worst counterfeit that's ever happened to mankind is the modern day Jesus. He's the worst counterfeit ever. He's the worst ever because what he does is he takes what we know to be the original and true Messiah, the one who walked Torah, talked Torah, lived Torah, did all these things that his father commanded, and he twists this man and he injects paganism in, into him. This is the plan of Hasatan. This is how he works. He takes what we know to be true and he injects his own paganism and his own twist into it to corrupt it. Now, why do I say this? I say this because it's important to understand when you're speaking to a Jewish person and you're trying to explain who Messiah actually was, do you want to know why they reject Jesus? Because they know he's a counterfeit. They know he's a counterfeit. How do they know it? Because you're telling them that this man tells me I don't need to keep the, the commandments that Moshe set. I don't need to observe the feast that Hashem has set. I don't need to do all these things that Moshe himself said, if any man comes and tells you to do otherwise, you should stone him because he's a false prophet. They know that. So when you go and you preach this counterfeit Jesus to these people who are looking for a Messiah to come, don't be surprised when they reject him. Don't be surprised. Why do I say all this? I say this because, brothers and sisters, it's important that we get back to the original version of who Messiah really is. Because that's the man, that's the one that we should be preaching to Israel. That's the man that we need to preach as Messiah. Let's examine. Bamidbar chapter 24, verse 17 to 19 says, I see him, but not now. I behold him but not soon. A star will step forth from Yaakov. A scepter will arise from Yisrael to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all descendants of Shet. His enemies will be his possessions, Edom and Seir possessions. Yisrael will do val valiantly. From Yaakov will come someone who will rule and he will destroy what is left of the city. In Parashat Balak, we read a profound prophecy regarding the coming Hamashiach, the Messiah. It tells of the coming ruler who would come forth from Yaakov, from the Jewish people, to destroy the enemies of Adonai. We know this Mashiach to be Rabbeinu Yeshua. But some among Israel question whether Yeshua was really Hamashiach, because they say if he was, Adonai's enemies would have already been subdued and we would have shalom on the earth. Of course, those who know Yeshua the Messiah, they understand that he would carry out his prophecy in stages. Mashiach would first come to suffer on behalf of his people and all those who would put their trust in him for the forgiveness of sin. We know the Torah supports this model through the Messianic, through the Messianic example of Yosef, Joseph and his story. It's a story that has Yosef first suffering on behalf of his brothers unjustly, even persecuted by his brothers, only to later rise to power as a great ruler during a time of great calamity to secure Israel's destiny. Of course, we know all of this, all of that plan of Yosef, all of his life was according to Hashem's sovereign will. So too, Yeshua HaMashiach would first come to suffer for his people and would wait for the right time to, fulfill, uh, to fully reveal himself at the final redemption and salvation of his people, Yisrael. It'll only be later when the depravity of the world comes to such an extreme state that Mashiach Yeshua will come to destroy the enemies of Hashem and bring final redemption to Kol Yisrael. Now, this is not my opinion. I'm not giving you my opinion today. This is what the Tanakh teaches. And this is why we don't have Shalom on the earth today. We read about some of this timing in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 6 where it says about the, the following, about the Akarit Hamayim, the end of days. 
I might get a little bit excited here, so bear with me. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. The earth was lit up by his splendor. He cried out in a strong voice, She has fallen! She has fallen! Babel the great! She has become a home for demons! A prison for every unclean spirit! A prison for every unclean hated bird! For all the nations have drunk of the wine of God's fury, caused by her whoring. Yes, the kings of the earth went whoring with her. And from her unrestrained love of luxury, the world's businessmen have grown rich. That sounds familiar. Then I heard another voice out of heaven say, My people, come out of her so that you will not share in her sin, so that you will not be inflicted, infected by her plagues. For her sins are a sticky mass piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Render to her as she has rendered to others. Pay her back double for what she has done. Use the cup in which she has brewed to brew her a double-sized drink. In the very next chapter, we read about the powerful second coming of Hamashiach to fulfill the prophecy we read about in Parashat Balak. Listen to this, Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. It says this, Next I saw heaven opened, and there before me was a white horse, Sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True, and it is in righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns. And he had a name written on which no one knew but himself. He was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down nations. He will rule them with a staff of iron. It is he who treads the winepress, from which flows the wine of the furious rage of Adonai, God of heaven's armies. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We and our people need to continue to be patient for all of this to come to pass. Because obviously, Israel is still waiting for that conquering king aspect of Hamashiach to be filled. In any case, whoever this Messiah would be, listen closely, whoever this Messiah would be, he had to first come 2,000 years ago when the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, was still standing. Again, this is not my opinion. I'm not giving you my opinion today because the Tanakh teaches us this. And not only does the Tanakh teach us this, not only did it have to happen to confirm that this Mashiach would be a son of David, proven through the genealogical records that were held in that temple, which we know have since been destroyed, but the Jewish sages of old also knew that Hamashiach had to come during that period of time through their own study of the Tanakh. As evidence of this, in Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin 97a, we read the following. Listen to what it says. Fascinating insight. It says, the school of Eliyahu taught 6,000 years is the duration of the world. 2,000 years are characterized by chaos. 2,000 years are characterized by Torah from the era of the patriarchs until the end of the Messianic period. And 2,000 years are the period of the coming of the Messiah. The 2,000 years spoken of in Tractate Sanhedrin speak of the time that Yeshua HaMashiach came and was proclaimed as Mashiach. 
So either their prophecy was wrong, and they didn't really know what was going on regarding the timing of Hamashiach, or he did indeed come. But because many of the people weren't worthy, they not only didn't recognize him, but what they were expecting, that ultimate judgment of Israel's enemies, it didn't come about at that time. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44, it talks about this reality. It says this, and I quoted this earlier this morning, beautiful passage of scripture, when Yeshua had come closer and could see the city. He wept over it saying, if you only knew today what was needed for Shalom, but for now it's hidden from your sight. For the days are coming upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you, encircle you, hem you in on every side and dash you to the ground. You and your children within your walls, leaving not one stone standing on another. And all because you didn't recognize your opportunity when God offered it. So how did some of the sages of Israel later react to missing this boat of Hamashiach? Talmud Bavli tractate Sanhedrin 97b. It states this, that is the course that history was to take, but due to our sins, that time frame increased. The Messiah did not come after 4,000 years passed, and furthermore, the years that have elapsed since then, which were to have been the Messianic era, era, they've elapsed. Just as Mashiach Yeshua said, our people, Israel, missed their opportunity. And as the sages witnessed during the time that Yeshua came, during the time they expected HaMashiach to come, Israel missed its opportunity because of its sin. So the reason we don't have shalom on the earth at this point, and the reason why the Messiah hasn't yet defeated our enemies, ultimately is because of our own sin. Just as the scriptures have witnessed, because we weren't righteous enough, Hamashiach would come to judge our enemies much later, during a time of great depravity, in the accurate Hamayim, the end of days. And the sages of Israel also recognized this. In Talmud Bavli, Tractate Sanhedrin 98a, we read, Rabbi Yochanan also said, listen to this, fascinating, the son of David will come only in a generation that is either altogether righteous or altogether wicked. In a generation that is altogether righteous, as it is written, your people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. Or altogether wicked, as it is written, and he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. And it is elsewhere written, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, I will do it. So, whether it's through our own study of the Tanakh, or through what the sages have said through their study of the Tanakh. Our people, Israel, shouldn't be surprised that peace hasn't yet come on the earth through Hamashiach. As both the scriptures and the sages have both noted, the final redemption will only come during a generation that's altogether wicked. That's the only time redemption is going to come. And the only one who has proven to be through the line of David, who came when expected during the time when the last Beit HaMikdash stood, who was like a prophet like Moshe, who lived and taught in Eretz Yisrael, was Yeshua ben Yosef HaMashiach. He is the only one that makes sense for our people and for you. No other man, brothers and sisters, could possibly qualify. What does that mean for us? It means that it's either him or nothing. It's either Yeshua, the Messiah, as Hamashiach, or it's no one. Because he fulfilled every single prophecy. He lived in the exact time that he was supposed to live. They knew it 
at the time. The records were in the temple that proved it at the time. But they rejected him. But I want you to make no mistake. For those that are still waiting for his return as the conquering king, I want you to understand when he returns, he will, Baruch Hashem, crush the enemies of God. As the prophecy in Parashat Balak, Balak says, Yeshua is the star that we're all looking for. Did you catch that when we read the Torah portion? Yeshua is the star that we're all looking for, which, forgive me, but that's my clever attempt to try to segue into a related topic that I want to try to touch on today. You see, there are not only those who seek to discredit Messiah Yeshua's claims to being Hamashiach, but there's also those among the nations who've taken an anti-Semitic stance against the star that represents him in our parasha. And I personally believe that both of these things are inspired rhetoric that comes straight from Ha Satan, that counterfeiter. Regarding the star, an attack against the Jewish people, the claim is made that the star of David, get this, they claim that the star of David is actually pagan. Have you heard this? I'm sure some of you probably have. But there are those, there are those out there, even among the brethren, who claim that the star of David is actually pagan. This deception about the star of David is often found among anti-Semitic teachers and groups, and even, as I just said, among some Hebrew roots groups. And it's even slithered its way into a few messianic circles. It is undoubtedly a deception of Ha Satan and a device that he's using for people to look and act toward the Jewish people in evil ways. And his plan, you have to admit, this plan has worked to some degree. You see, those making the claim that the Star of David is satanic, and I've ha I had somebody probably a year ago say this to me. They, they claim that this Star of David is satanic. I, it blew my mind. But what they try to do is they try to point out that there's satanic groups that also use this symbol. While some of these cults have taken on this symbol, among other previously found among God's people, they do so to somehow use it for their own gain because they believe that there's some type of power in it. For example, Satanists and those who practice sorcery they also use various Hebrew words. Did you know that? It's not limited to just the symbols, but they also use various Hebrew words. Did you know that they even use the actual Hebrew name of God? yod heh vav -Hey. They use that name in their incantations and their prayers. Did you know that? So if they do that, let me, let me ask you a question. The question becomes... Do they use the name of the holy God of Israel because it's pagan or satanic? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. As I mentioned at the very start, we need to remember that Hasatan, our enemy, he is the great counterfeiter. He tries to copy Adonai in his attempt to deceive. He tries to present counterfeits, but with his own demented and twisted mindset to try to mislead people and lead you off the righteous path. So brothers and sisters, as intelligent as some of you may be, and as much as you may know more than I do, and I'm not saying that you don't, maybe you do, we have got to be cautious about our reasoning and our logic when it comes to listening to some of these harebrained ideas and left-wing claims about our Messiah and about this star. Another example is that some will also try to twist Scripture to make it sound like the Star of David is pagan. Two passages that they often abuse to try to make this point are Amos 5.26, which says, No, but now you will bear Sukkot as your king and Kiyun your images, 
the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. The second passage they try to twist, it quotes Amos, and it's found in Maasim, Acts 7, 43. It says this, No, you carried the tent of Molech and the star of your God, Raphan, the idols you made so that you could worship them. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babel. Just as the God of Israel, of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov has his own mark, as you can find in Ezekiel 9, 4 through 6, Revelation 7, verse 3, Revelation 9, verse 4, which Hasatan tries to copy with his own versions, as you see in Revelation 13, 15 to 17. So too we see in our parashah, Adonai has his own star, which Hasatan tries to counterfeit with his own perverted version. But in the case of the Magin David, which people call the Star of David, I believe in a positive context, it is indeed based in the history and the scriptures of Israel. With regards to its historical usage, Archaeological evidence exists to this day in Israel. This symbol was used and found on synagogues and stonework that existed in the first century. But anti-Semites that peddle their pagan nonsense, they won't tell you that. They won't. In addition to this, it was actually used in what's called the Messianic Seal of Yerushalayim a symbol that the first century congregation of Messiah used. And it's the same symbol that I often use. If you see some of the stuff, stuff that I put up for the congregation, I often use that same symbol. It looks like a fish with a star on the bottom of it. This is all well-documented stuff. So the question again comes around to, so were, were all these first century congregations worshiping Molech? Do you, do you honestly believe that? Of course they weren't. This symbol has been found on pottery and other items dating back to the first century in Yerushalayim and was used as one of the symbols, as I said, for the Messianic congregation in the first century. There's a significant amount of archaeological evidence that's not only been documented by other people, but that you can see with your own eyes in Eretz Yisrael. But those wanting to spread the counterfeit truth of Hasatan, they don't take the time to research these things. You know what they do? It's a lot like us. You know what they do? They latch onto whatever opinion they find on the internet and they adopt that opinion as the gospel truth. What some of these people who claim that the Star of David is a demonic symbol don't tell you and it's most possibly because they don't know, is that during the time of Molech David, King David's days, there was a different type of Hebrew writing system that was used. Some call it Paleo-Hebrew, which I've shared with you guys before. A couple of weeks ago, I shared a bit. And some call it Phonetica Hebrew. But regardless of what you call it, the interesting fact is, listen to this, the interesting fact is the Hebrew letter Dalet or Dalit looked exactly like a triangle. It looked like a triangle. Why does that matter? Why does it matter what this particular letter looked like? Because if you study history, you'll come to understand that it was common with kings and those among Israel to have a symbol that represented them on their shields. So in the case of Melech David, Israeli historical teachers tell us he simply used the first and last letters of his first name, David, which obviously begins and ends with none other than the Hebrew letter Dalit, Dalet, which looked like what? Triangles. So what did he do? David overlaid them on his shield, which represented him when he was in battle, so that he would be known. This is actually why the Star of David is known in Hebrew as the Magin David. What does Magin David mean? I'm 
so glad you asked me. Because the literal translation, get this, is the shield of David. Now, you might be shocked by this. This might be new information for you. But I want you to understand, this is how the Jewish people have always understood it. They've always seen it this way. So far from being a pagan or satanic symbol, as we see in our parish hall, this symbol, it goes way beyond that, brothers and sisters. And this is one of the reasons Hasatan hates it so much. This symbol actually is representative of the king of Israel. Again, we read about this in the prophecy, Balaam proclaimed by the Spirit of God. The Midbar 24, 17 to 19, it says this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not soon. I read this slowly before. A star will step forth from Yaakov. A scepter will arise from Israel to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all descendants of Shet. His enemies will be his possessions, Edom and Seir possessions. Israel will do valiantly. From Yaakov will come someone who will rule and he will destroy what is left of the city. Is the star in this passage associated with the God of Israel a pagan star? Of course not. Of course it's not. As can be seen in this passage, the Magin David, the Star of David, is a deeply messianic symbol. It's no wonder the enemy uh, wants to take it and use it as part of his counterfeit version. And at the same time, use it to cause people to turn against the Jewish people who use it as their very symbol, the symbol of their nation. I recall him doing something similar with a rainbow. You remember that? You ever think of him using a rainbow for the same purpose? You see, Hasatan is a great deceiver. He is a great deceiver. And people shouldn't allow themselves to be deceived by him and give him a victory. The star of David speaks of the Messiah because he is the star spoken of in Bamidbar 24, 17 to 19. He is the one that would rule in the line of David. In addition, some of you might recall that there was a special star that was used as a sign that Messiah had come into the world in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. And it's a symbol that's used to point to the Messiah in Scripture by the Shelachim, the apostles. Kephabet, 2 Peter 1, 19. It says, yes, we have the prophetic word made very certain. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in the dark, murky place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Although Hasatan fancies himself as the morning star, brothers and sisters, Melech Yeshua is the true morning star. Also in Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, Yeshua confirms for us, if there was any doubt or any question, he confirms for us that the symbol of the star is representative of him. He says, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify these things to you for the assemblies. Listen, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Notice here how the symbol of the star relates directly back to David. Why? Because Yeshua the Messiah is the star of David. Is he not? He is the star of David. Contrary to those who are either known anti-Semites 
or to those who've been deceived by their teaching. The concept of the Star of David is thoroughly founded in Scripture and found early on in the history of our people. The nation of Israel to this day awaits the coming of Messiah. Now look, although many of them don't believe that Yeshua was the Messiah, I believe the nation of Israel bears the symbol of the Davidic Messiah on their flag. The banner of Israel. Tehillim 60, verses 4 through 5, it says this. To those who fear you because of the truth you gave, a banner to rally around. Selah. So that those you love could be rescued. So save with your right hand and answer us. The banner spoken of here is clearly one that speaks of the Messiah as it's related to Adonai's truth, his salvation and his right hand. Brothers and sisters, as we rally around the banner of Adonai, which is the star of Yaakov, the star of David, He'll soon come and destroy the enemies of Adonai. And he's going to rule the earth with all authority. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem, Adonai.